on air. So um, we will go ahead and open up the budget workshop here, and um, I will probably turn it over to our town manager to kind of walk us through where we're starting tonight and take it from there. Okay, uh, I ha received a phone call this morning about 9 o'clock from uh, Main DOT that um, they needed by next week several letters of uh, recommendation or whatever we call it for the roundabout project. So we're scrambling to work on that. As you know, uh, we have committed uh, our 10 percent through our TIF funds uh, for the construction of the roundabout, uh, but they also asked, fortunately tonight and not tomorrow, for basically in a council endorsement that they would move forward with the funding if we got the uh, congressional earmark. So what you have before you is kind of what's on the screen right now. It's this uh, legal size sheet that's uh, in uh, landscape form. And what I want to point out to you, and I'll try to do it as best as I can up here, is that we have, we have had the funding for the roundabout at um, uh, approximately $2 million. We rounded it up to $160,000 a year, which would represent about uh, um, $2 million worth of funding we would have access to. My, my recommendation <coughs> would be that in FY26, it might not it might not start until FY26, our FY26, um, so I would hold off on bonding anything until you actually knew when the project would start. If we received funding uh, this month or next month, uh, we would probably be a year in final design and selection and all that. Uh, probably wouldn't be ready for construction until uh, the summer of, of 25, which would be our FY26. So these line up pretty well. Um, we have had this in our budget for, well, I've had these projects here listed for a while, but we're going to get into these in more depth at our next meeting when we, we kind of wrap up most of the budget discussion. But I wanted to just kind of give you an early review of what we were looking at. Um, if you go down through the lines, you'll see things like, um, uh, annual paving, we've been doing that for a long time, uh, budgeting anywhere. Last year was a big year, about $1.3 million. Uh, this year we're knocking it down a little bit, uh, down to just under $600,000. Um, and uh, we're also looking at the public safety tower this year. Um, that's a uh, potentially a $3 million project. That's why you see, anytime you see these numbers that go the same all the way across the page, that really represents a bonded oh. project. So. You see 240 a year, and that goes all the way across the page. That's for the uh, three million, up to three million dollars for that uh, um, those communication towers uh, for public safety. We're hopeful that uh, once they're constructed, we'll be able to recover some of those uh, costs by selling space out to other uh, cell providers. Uh, right now, we've tried for unsuccessfully for two years to get them to come here and basically build towers, but. That can change at any time, and we're going to keep pushing that if we can. Um, we also have what I call summit expenses. As gas mains get put in around town, uh, we basically share the cost of inspection with them 50-50. That's worked out really well and probably to our advantage more than anything. Uh, they also have a road bond in place for every year. I think it's about 100000 or 150000 that gets renewed every year. That's part of that cost as well. And then if you come down, um, there's 600000 in there. Uh, this is kind of a good news situation. Um, it looks like there's a new purchase and sale agreement for uh, the Route 1 uh, construction. Uh, Peter Kennedy sold his remaining land uh, to uh, Richard Hebert. They've got a purchase and sale agreement in place. And uh, if that goes through um, Skyview Drive, and Route 1 would have a turning lane on it. Um, that 600000 is to go towards some of those costs that are eligible in that project. Uh, that would make the project for Foley's, and it looks like we may also see that senior housing project back again that Xanton walked away from. So uh, Amy Cullen, a Cumberland resident, is, has been working with me and my staff and trying to bring that project back to the table. So. You should, I hope, fingers crossed, uh, in the next few months see something back from both of those uh, people for uh, the credit enhancement agreement that was already approved for Foley's and um, hopefully 
uh, a similar project, if not identical, to the one that the planning board approved with Zanton. So we don't know what that's what the timing of both of those are. They're going to go through closing. I think the closing is somewhere between uh, 90 and 120 days. So in the next few months, all of those pieces should come back together. So that number is really a placeholder for right now. Um, I also put another placeholder in there for 80,000 for a part-time housing director, and that would be somebody that would eventually oversee, now this comes from the housing task force recommendation, so this is why I said I wanted to lay it out for you tonight, and then in three weeks, we're not meeting on the 22nd because of Passover, uh, we're gonna push that out to the 29th, that meeting. Uh, on the 29th, we'll be meeting to uh, basically talk more in detail about each one of these items. The items that you see there in blue and that are in blue in your paper, uh, those are items that I would, uh, I haven't had funding for, and uh, especially anything to do with transit, affordable housing, and even this position with the uh, part-time housing director. If you look on your screen here, you'll see this red circle, and that's around FY28. That begins in June, uh, July 1st of 27. That's the year TIF-1 will expire. And when TIF-1 expires, you lose it forever. So my recommendation to you is to have some discussion over the next year and consider about redoing uh, TIF-1 to uh, be an affordable housing TIF and a uh, transit TIF. If you, if you designate that, those, that district as a affordable housing transit di TIF district, 75% of the money generated has to be spent on either transit or affordable housing or one or the other or both. So <laughs> that would give you 20 more years to do something with future projects. Uh, look at uh, Metro. Uh, Metro will probably be here in either June or July to talk to you about uh, potential uh, route into Cumberland and uh, where, we could, uh, where we could see some potential growth. They will also talk to you about their micro transit. So um, those of you who remember when Metro was here last time, there was very little flexibility in the east-west routes. They really wanted to go north-south. Well, now this micro transit is, I guess the best way I can describe it is like, it's like an Uber ride from your house to the bus station. And that micro transit has a smaller vehicle of some, it could be a van, could be a passenger van that would travel, and they're doing this uh, pilot project in Falmouth, I think, this year, uh, where we bring, bring the driver that is requesting a ride down to the transit stop so it could jump on the bus and basically co uh, continue and proceed. Uh, it's an actually pretty cool idea. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of opportunities for east-west uh, travel here in our town, and, you know, with all the passenger buses, we own two, uh, the school owns a bunch of them, I think we could figure out a way to work if really people were interested in maybe even expanding that service uptown, maybe Tuttle, Blanchard, and Skillens Road out to the, you know, the fire station in West Cumberland somewhere where we have municipal parking all along that route. So there's some ideas. The other idea is uh, with the Down Easter and looking at uh, Styles Way and the 10, 12 acre field we had designated for the Little League fields we could actually still put that parking lot in there or a portion of that parking lot uh, and bring that right out to, the, uh, uh, to a platform where the rail could intersect that. And that, would, that wouldn't be, you know, that would be a good use of that money as well. Uh, and then you'd still have money for affordable housing. Right now that district, uh, District 1 generates about uh, $800,000 plus a year of revenues. Again, it'll expire in FY28. What I would strongly recommend you do is not let it expire before extending it. So once it goes to expiration, it's done. How much runway? That's the same question. Um, how much runway uh, would we need as a town uh, to make it not expire? Um, a year, six months? Like uh, yeah, that's plenty. You have plenty of time to do it now. I mean, we're not even into you know FY twenty five yet. Uh, FY twenty five is going to begin on July first, so. Between now, between now and uh, probably next spring, because next spring, all these TIF agreements are dated for April 1st each year, okay. so it would be best if you could do it between now and next spring, but you really have until, you know, 
June 1st of uh, 2027 to you know have this ready to go. So you have you know two three years to do this. But ideally before. Ideally, you should have some discussions and and talk about what you'd like to do. And then the sooner that you get as the sooner you get that approved, it wouldn't be approved until next April or the following April, depending on when you kind of line this up. Um, you could uh, have plenty of time to set up what you'd like to do for. Uh, potentially a housing director could be 100% funded from that. Um, the capital work that would go into building a platform, a train station, a parking lot, all that would, could be funded through that district and operational funds for both uh, and to pay for uh, transit. The first three years of the transit, you'll get a kind of a, a sweetheart deal. They, they basically give you federal congestion mitigation monies to you spend and it reduces your cost to Metro. It'll be probably in that $50,000 range. Uh, after the three years, you're gonna be in the 130 to 140,000 range. It's where Falmouth and Yarmouth, <laughs> uh, where Yarmouth is. And that's potentially where you would land, but that those funds too can be paid from TIF monies. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to explore transit and it gives you a lot of, ex uh, as well as affordable housing moving forward. So um, the reason I bring this up tonight is because tonight um, I'm going to ask you to add an item to your agenda. It'll be a, the last item would be to authorize a town manager uh, to expend up to 10% of the roundabout project monies from TIF funds. So we're looking just for the authorization to send them a letter that says, should we get funding for the roundabout project, we would be authorized up to 10% uh, capped at 2 million without, uh, if it goes beyond that, we'd have to come back for additional council authorization. So that's why, that's, this is why this has kind of jumped to the front of the line tonight for the finance committee. Uh, it's an important item, it's an important thing we've been working on for several years and I think it warrants some time just for you to kind of let it sink in a little bit. Uh, the only obligation would be if we, if the federal government came and said, look, we're going to basically fund 90% of this for you. Do you, you want the 12, 13 million dollars or not? And I hope you would say yes, that we'd love to build this project. Because remember, it's not just the roundabout. It's also the sidewalks that are going to be going from Skillens, Greenhouse, all the way down to the bottom of Morrison's Hill on both sides of the road. It's the sidewalks that'll go up to the bridge on Blackstrap Road to connect that for a future bridge deck and hopefully a future sidewalk on that deck. Uh, and then also uh, back in the other direction, um, is it Kathy Lane, the first uh, street there? Yeah. yeah, toward Kathy Lane. So I think we really did a nice job. There are gonna be esplanades through there, there'll be street lighting, there'll be a lot of amenities that are gonna be paid for, uh, you know, through a, hopefully a federal earmark. And, as earmarks go, this is a fairly small one, <laughs> but uh, still it's a fairly big project for us and one we couldn't do without this kind of uh, commitment. The commissioner is the one that's submitting it, the, the DOT commissioner uh, to our uh, congressional delegation. Bob. If I understood when you first started your remarks, you were looking for a vote from us, uh, and that is an indication that we are in favor of accepting funds. And does that start a clock? Uh, for us to commit to the funding for it? Uh, it? It commits the funding if you receive the earmark. So we will know about the earmark probably in the next two months. So you kind of there's two actions taken. The one is the last item. On the agenda is to and authorize the And the other the one is something that we will do within the next couple of months or sooner. Uh, we'll do that tonight. Tonight. Tonight we've got to get the authorization to commit to the 10% funding should we be authorized, so should we get the earmark. Just one action then. Only one action. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that was only just to kind of bring you out because I was hoping to unroll this whole thing in, t in a few weeks when we did the just started right from the TIF from the beginning just to see each district, what each district is bringing in, what <coughs> we're dealing with monies. The very bottom of that sheet kind of shows you where we are. We're kind of in a deficit mode now because we've done a lot of projects with TIF monies. That very bottom line, uh, we're projecting to be at about 1.7 million underwater this year. Uh, by 2020, by 2033, if, if you do everything that's on the sheet, uh, you'll be coming out coming out of that about 2032, and by 2048, there'll still be about four million dollars left to spend um, at the finish line. The difficulty I have with these numbers right now is these are all pre-value, pre-reval, and there are still a lot of big projects that haven't hit the books yet, 
And when those projects hit the books, that those numbers will creep up and that deficit will creep down. So this is all future IOUs right now if nothing changed. There's a lot that's going to change between now and September of uh, 25. Shirley. Shirley. Show my ignorance here. I, I couldn't find my sheet from last year. That was the TIF sheet. It seemed like we were out of the red earlier than we are. Like it was like three more years where we were in the red for the TIF. So this What's gets approved changed? every year. And what I added is what is permitted in the TIF uh, documents today. So you'll see, um, you'll see the roundabout in there. You'll also see uh, fire truck payments in there. Uh, you'll also see uh, the transit potential. Uh, you know, there's a, that blue area has no, no dollars associated with okay. it. Okay. The ones below will be another fire truck back, you know, uh, from TIF 8 uh, that starts around FY27. The Skyview Drive access was added this year to it. Um, the housing director was added. And there could be more things over time that you want to look at. I just put those in as a placeholder so we don't kind of forget what we might want to buy because what happens if this sheet's a blank sheet, people will come in and think we have, you know, $7 million to spend when we've got other projects that no, are kind we're of in the knitted red. in. So where does the money come from when we're in the red? It comes from, it comes from an IOU from the general fund. So the, basically you have... So this is money borrowed out of the general fund from the pay fund. Yes. all those years until... Until we come back out of okay. the line. Yep. Um, one thing I'd like to look at, and this may be how you did it last year, you did the fiscal year maybe by TIF 1, to, by the eight different TIFs. Yep. What they were, what they're... Sure. That, that's what I, I was like planning to, to do on the 29th, so you okay. could see the value of each district when they expire, and we'll get, we'll get into that pretty deep next time so that you'll see where those districts all line up. You won't, I'm a, I'm, what I'm afraid of, honestly, is that you'll have more projects than you will uh, monies because things will just keep getting added and I know, added I'm and added. About that. So you can, we can start with a blank sheet of paper very easily. I can wipe out all those numbers after 25 except for things that you commit to. Every year you basically have committed some monies to paving. Uh, last year we had a lot of uh, matching funds that we were able to get. Uh, and we're going to continue to try to maximize those when we can. So uh, that was helpful. Main Street was one of those where we, we were able to get $300,000 of money. So we basically said we'd be crazy not to take that, but it did put us uh, back a little bit. But it was TIF eligible. So why spend it from your general fund when you can spend it from your TIF fund? So okay. we'll give you that whole list, and I'll show you each one of the eight districts and how they line up. So, But the real news for the TIF issue is just just be careful and have a plan because you don't have to fund all that equipment out of the TIF funds. I just basically threw it out there just to show you that once you start down that path, especially if it's a bond, then you basically are stuck on that path for 20 years. So you might want to consider doing the bonds from the general fund and, and leaving that for other major capital funds. And that's your call. Yeah, I'd like to caution the council, I've been listening to some information about debt, government debt that just keeps rising and rising and rising. And um, I don't, this is still debt, even though it's not a bond, it's still debt. And it doesn't show up quite like other indebtedness, right? In our books, if you were just to look at our books, this, but it's still an IOU. It's yeah. just not to a bond bank. It's not to and that's one of the, the issues we've had with our auditors and asked for more informational and more uh, funds and reports that would be put into the audit so that you could actually see which district, where, where they were, what they, where they were headed, which ones were going to be your predominant districts. Okay. So all of that, I'm hopeful. i um, been working with Katie, and we actually hired an outside audit firm to come in to help with us to kind of line these up, our capital as well as our TIF, because... That was one of the hardest things we've done because we've been doing a lot of this through Excel, and we said, how do we get this into Munis? And that auditor said, well, it should be in Munis. Well, it's been in Munis, but it's been kind of hodgepodge around a little bit. So 
we want to clean that up. We want to basically be able to go in and say, show us what our values for each district are. Each district will have its own account. Each district will have its own funding source. And it's a lot cleaner and easier to follow than following it on an Excel spreadsheet. So I could put anything up there and, you know, how do you, how do you tie that back to our accounting? And that's what I'd like to see. So, so talking about debt, I think the other, the other piece of debt is what is that ratio between uh, revenues, uh, you know, valuation. You know, sometimes you say, well, I got a lot of debt. I mean, well, I've, I've taken out more debt, but it, you know, people get a raise, they, they're, so they have, they have the ability to take on more debt. So I think it's, that's, that's an important way to look at it, too, is, is equity. Right. So we just start to say, we got a bunch of debt. We may have a bunch of debt, but how does that play out in relationship to revenues and, and our ability to pay it? And no, I think that's a really good, good sign of caution, but I'd also caution you that these have finite lives. Right. So when you get to 2048, you don't want to have any money left over. You really want to have expended all the money that you said you were going to expend. You want to pay it. You want to you want to build stuff. You want to basically, you know, do the capital projects you wanted to do and do all the things you laid out in each one of those documents. So uh, to me, uh, putting it up there at least shows you you've got a little bit of a plan. Uh, but as you go forward, I'd be looking out, you know, five, ten years and see where you're going to land. This gets you in a place where you'll be okay when you get to the finish line. Like I said, you're going to still be, you know, four to five million dollars to the good, but that money is it's going to be closer to reality in another year or two because I, I think it's grossly underestimated right now. I mean, I, I would also think that it might make sense for us. I mean, even if we did decide to extend TIF 1, um, that doesn't lock us into particular projects, right? So we could do the comprehensive plan, get all of that feedback, and use that as our gold posts for Absolutely. what projects we do moving forward, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Very easy to do. I honestly, I would get away from fire trucks and look more at infrastructure such as extension of water lines. You know, my personal feeling would be to get to, to eliminate the fire trucks out that we have in there and put in there, uh, you know, that water tower on uh, Blueberry Hill, which would get the critical portion of Bruce Hill Road, uh, you know, water, yeah. which it desperately needs. So I think you have a ton of options and I just, you don't have to jump just because somebody asked you, we got to do it today. Well, you got you got, you know, 24 more years to get it done, and as long as you keep looking ahead, I think you'll be okay. So that's that's kind of the issue I had for tonight related to that item on your agenda. I also gave to you tonight um, kind of our our answers to questions that have come up so far in the budget process, and they're in this handout. This is uh, about four pages now. <laughs> Um, we'll get uh, we'll get that put online tomorrow, and oh, they're all good questions. They're all good questions. So we'll have those online tomorrow. Um, and I'm going to jump to a different slide now. Um, Before we jump, real oh. quick, just to clarify, I think to Shirley's point about the red underneath here, as you track it, obviously we want to dance around zero as best we can all the way to the finish line, right? You want to end with nothing in the account, effectively, right? Um, but I remember also in the previous sheets that we had, like I, I had thought that we turned into the black in like, Earlier. yeah, like 2029 20, like, or yeah. 2030 or something, it, which still even then seemed like forever. But that's what I asked. And that's I'm, why he said he added those, other, like the fire truck yep, and the yep, tower. Okay. and So those, those additional things. additions are what's keeping us yep. a little right. bit longer runway in the red, right? And I happy to take all those off, but no, I also a, caution okay. I just to wanted say, to make sure I was remembering it No, correctly. you're absolutely okay. right. Uh, for our meeting on the 29th, I'll basically leave the, hopefully, the um, money for the uh, roundabout on there, and I'll take off, um, you know, um, anything to the right of 25 that has not been approved yet. So the Yeah, and even if you did the, like, the categories, and then I think under the categories you put what what they paid for yeah you know yeah so we can see nope. tiff one you know tiff pays for it gets to be well they all pay for everything kind of so that's you know like paving they all tri contribute to that's paving that's true and so but there's not all, but they're some not are all restricted. blended yeah. some of them like the paramedics have to come out of tiff eight uh some of the other stuff can come out of the other districts so 
it yeah. does bounce around a little does, bit. Does does the summit expense, <laughs> the capital outlay that ends in 28, is that because that activity only happens in TIF 1? Or no, why, why does uh, it stop? It, it, I don't think they're going to be putting a lot more gas mains in. Got it. So a lot, of, a lot of years we don't even reach that number. So last year I think they put in a gas main on Route 1. Uh, they extended it up to that... Uh, new apartment uh, condo complex thing um, and um, that you know we had to have monies for so we left it in there there are a few more like they're looking to bring um, the gas underneath the turnpike as well so that extension is going to require more exp uh, inspection down in that area of, of West Cumberland so there are things that they're doing that we just don't know usually until you know the spring when they have their work plan for the summer and I just didn't want to be caught, you know, having to take it from our own paving budget out of the uh, general fund. So that's why it's there. It can disappear once, you know, once you feel like they're pretty I well I think done. it's wise to have energy options. Yeah. They said last week that electricity is going up 12%. I know, which frustrates me so much about because the Because all these stuff. people have, you know, people with cars that plug in. Well, Bob's working on that with me right now. You want to talk to them about that, Bob, a little bit? No. No. <laughs> I want to hold my powder for just a little bit You're, longer. I should know you're way ahead of me in the thinking so department. I, I just want to throw something out. We have a capital improvement project, CIP. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and we can either borrow it and pay for it through the general fund. And so a lot of these things here, to me, are capital improvement projects, but paying for it in a different way. Right. right. It's still debt, but I think it's important that we, we, you know, analyze that these are capital improvement for their long-term goals for the community, and the funding mechanism is different. There's, there's a couple of different ways to fund it, and one of the ways is through TIF projects, TIF monies. Okay, that being said, uh, back to Summit. Uh, I, I noticed that there was a, I think there's a plan for bringing in the gas to Valhalla. Chris, I don't remember that. Uh, we, we ha they asked us, and I think they would do it in a heartbeat. Uh, our, uh, if you remember when Maine State Golf Association and Rachel's, they were both had a pretty sweetheart deal with propane, and they never wanted to change over. Right, right. So that's why we haven't yet. But, I mean, it comes right through the woods there, I think, and goes up Valhalla Road a little bit. So we're pretty close to the main if we wanted to. antiquated heating cooling system with a heat pump system and the reason why we qualify for that is because we're not on natural gas right now so it's more going to be electrical uh, heat pumps more so than natural gas so that right, then goes, it goes right back, back to, to the expansion <laughs> of the solar field and uh, yeah capital improvement projects that have long-term benefits to the community net zero in energy cost at some point by expansion there and electrification yeah, we're, we've been doing pretty well. Chris has had a, a good relationship. Siemens did basically all the school conversions. Uh, I think they've done a good job at the schools. Uh, they did our senior housing uh, project. Um, the senior housing project uh, has been a little bit of a challenge, I mean, especially in the last two months where we've lost power twice. Um, this last big storm we had, we've been up, we were up there daily just to do safety checks and wellness checks on everybody. Everybody was in good spirits. but. Um, it just leads to thinking about, you know, we're going to have to look at some type of um, uh, generators or heating systems to put in those places that would work when the, um, uh, the power went out because uh, a lot of people like myself have you know, gas stoves that work through a power outage and those are just direct vents right out the side of the house and they would work pretty well. But do you balance that against, you know, potentially a generator? Uh, you put a generator in and maybe you have to put five generators in, four generators in, just the way they're wired. I talked to Rusty Guggins today, and he's going to do a little, a little homework to see if we can um, somehow put a generator in prior to it being stepped down at the transformers. Because if we could, if we could do it ourselves, and once the power went out, the generator would kick in and feed the transformers, then I don't have to worry about which house is on, which house is off, which circuit is on, which circuit is off. And 
and it would almost act as a generator for that whole circle. Um, I, I think it can be done, but I don't know if it would be so expensive, it would be cheaper just to put in smaller units around the circle. So we're playing around with that right now. We'll have to go back to the Housing Authority with that proposal and see what their thoughts are. The problem is it's always a crisis when it's right next to an event. And about six months from now, it's no longer a crisis. We haven't had a power outage. What are you worried about? I and don't know with all the you know, flooding. Yeah, then it we'll deal with be, the water. You know. Yeah, right. So I think we're going to be in this cycle for a while. And I think we're, I think getting prepared for it is, is not a bad thing. And maybe it's a, Maybe it's a smaller program where all we're doing is turning on some lights and the heating systems because they're all gas-fired stove. They're not drawing a lot of electricity, so we could really pretty much power up most of their heating systems and maybe a few lights without too, too much of a, of a generator. So those are the things we're playing around with, and I think uh, hopefully by fall we'll have a, uh, something to the uh, housing authority so they can look at it and uh, analyze it. and. You know, even if it's portable generators, uh, and if, if, if it's a small enough load that we could do with portable generators, we'd be willing to look at that too. Uh, portable generators and transfer switches outside the building. So there's a lot of ideas that are kicking around right now, and hopefully um, we'll come up with something. Chris, do you feel like you're getting good advice from Siemens? We haven't, we haven't received a full report yet. We had a bad run with them Here. once. Yeah, at this building. And uh, yeah. so I'm... They owe us some goodwill. Uh, I, I think <laughs> Make sure you capitalize on that. It's a good project. <laughs> I think it'll be a good project. We're just trying to figure out what, when it comes in what the expense is going to be. Okay. We may, if it is a big expense, we may try to phase it in over two or three years. So. Okay. Good. Thank you. Just our, our memories are long. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to uh, probably jump over there because I can't see. Um, we are, we are still working through uh, the budget process right now, and uh, I'll, I'm not going to try to sugarcoat this in any way, but it, it has not been a fun year or a fun budget process. Um, my biggest concern, honestly, is I'm not sure where to go anymore uh, because we have gone through all of the capital, uh, all of the operational budgets. And we've gone through all the revenue budgets, and we have squeezed every dime we can out of the revenues and looked at everything in the capital budgets. And we're really going to be down to uh, essentially personnel. If you want to make changes, I think that's really the only place that it will work. I think we have catching up to do with some of our neighbors uh, as far as um, Wages are concerned. Uh, I think we're doing pretty well keeping the staff we've been able to keep, but I think it's going to get harder every year. So I'll just come over to that side for a sec. <clears throat> so when I when I look at, I don't want to lose anything. I'm very nervous when I close these sheets. Um, all right, here's my checklist. So we have gone through all of the departments and basically all the department requests <clears throat> and reduced that by well over 300,000. Then we get down to the bottom line. Uh, good news, our, our, our uh, health insurance came in at 2% this year. So now we were able to reduce the um, operational budget another twenty thousand dollars. We haven't applied that to every single account yet. Well, I think Katie just did, so we're getting very close to real numbers. But and I'll have those for you next time. But the the overall uh, increase in in the operational budget is about nine hundred and twenty three thousand um, dollars. We have over a quarter million dollar increase in recreation, but uh, they also have an increase in their revenues as well. Um, and our general revenues, uh, we just added another 25000 to the fire EMS lines because they basically have been producing closer to 185, 200000 a year, not the 160 we we've had budgeted. So, but that still gets us down to, you know, 5.78% expenses, so around $370,000 in additional expenses. Remember that we lost $155,000 in revenue sharing this year, and that, that was a real 
kick in the gut, to be honest with you. Did, did uh, we get any clarifying information from the state not as to yet. why the drop? Not yet. It's it's here. The, the information has to do with formulas, and their formula changed. The second part of revenue sharing uh, changed slightly, and it sounds really small, but they changed it by um, 13, 13 hundredths of a percentage, and when they did that, uh, we lost $155,000. Wow. So I've got a call into Maine Revenue and just to sit down and just if they can explain it. The complicated formulas they have out there are just that. They're numbers that don't mean much to most of us and how they get there is, is interesting. But, uh, but had we not lost that, uh, we'd have been okay. What happened to us last year between the two years uh, from FY23 to FY24, and these are FY25 projections, is that we gained $400 million in appreciation as a town. Doesn't mean we built $400 million worth of stuff. It means all our values went up $400 million. Now, that seems like a lot. And uh, when, we, when we're basically basing our budget on today at $1.5 billion to go up $400 million, the state's valuing us at just over $2.3 billion today. So uh, if we keep doing that, that's, it's going to be a big number when we get to uh, the actual revals. I mean, we were estimating it was 60%, but it's, it's definitely climbing above that. And can you remind me, the state has us at such a higher number because they're using trued up numbers day in, day out, and we just haven't caught up by doing our own reval to bring those numbers up. That's why we're still at the $1.5 billion as opposed right. to 2 point whatever billion. We haven't done a revaluation since 2008. And that was with the first, the last new numbers we presented. That was right after Shabig Island left yeah. Cumberland. So then we went through a whole series of recessions, and, and that lasted you know six or seven years. We came out of that. We were thinking about it. Numbers seemed to be better. But uh, right after the um, pandemic, things just got crazy, so, and during the pandemic. So we're at a point where we have to do something. Um, we'll probably end up somewhere closer to 2.4 billion than 1.6 billion, but um, even that seems a reach. But uh, the way the, the sales are still going fairly strong, uh, we don't see us going backwards, but everyone has to be trued up to a fair value, and that's what John has been working on, and he'll be at it, uh, you know, pretty pretty aggressively, uh, you know, in the next month or two. So uh, he'll get this year put to bed. The curveball that the state threw at him last year was the whole tax stabilization piece, and he had to work on that with mega report requirements that he had to fill out for the state, and we received over $300,000 in, you know, state stabilization funds. Uh, we're at, we're all caught up right now, Katie. Right? They paid us our last payment. So uh, last week was the last payment. So they did 100% pay us back. So nothing, you know, that was that was really good. But uh, you know, we were curious to see where that was going to go, and we did get all our money back, which is good. So even though we're you know still 370 and searching for more to basically uh, take that off of the mill rate if we can. Uh, the SAD is still very early in the game. They're still looking at somewhere around 7.8% or uh, that's almost a $1.8 million increase. Uh, the county is up uh, a little over 100,000. Uh, that's our total payment. But remember, you know, we part of that payment is $95,000 that we paid over that when they changed their, their year, year to a period. fiscal year. It's interesting about, sorry to interrupt, but the SAD budget when I was taking a look at it, they have $810,000 coming off debt service, and they still have a $1.7 million increase. So, so talking to the mic so they can hear you, they're going to start yelling at right. me in a minute. So I'll say that for the public who chooses to watch. Yep. They, When I looked at their budget, it, they have an $810,000 reduction in debt service. If you add their increase of 1.792 or 1.8, we're looking at more of a $2.6 million increase than a $1.8 million increase. I would hope to think that they could bring that down. That's, that's a yeah, huge and, increase. And these are very preliminary numbers. They, these aren't okay. things that they have really uh, gotten too deep into the budget. And maybe uh, they disregarded that 810 thinking that that's their cushion or <laughs> something for, for later on, but. 
Well, and then the other thing is, as these TIF districts grow, the, the TIF district budgets are basically p part of our tax rate as well. Uh, the, those funds have to be raised, and uh, that uh, the, those TIF districts increased by about uh, $314,000 this year over last year just in value, more, more, most, mostly Ocean View across the street and some of the Route 1 stuff. So that brings us up to about a uh, $2.2 million increase to the mill rate, and that's pretty significant. So that's about $1.20 right now. So it's big, big numbers. So what, when I look at that, I just try to figure out, okay, where do we start to try to, uh, you know, bring that number down? And when we're a pretty small percentage of that, it's, it doesn't, doesn't come easy. So you have in front of you all my math and all my worksheets, um, primarily because I think it's easier to follow the math when you see it's on that 11 by 17 sheet. Uh, you can look at that, and, and if you get stuck, let me know. But um, I use it just to try to make sure we don't miss something. Um, everything from, uh, you know, the county tax to uh, the, the TIF funds to everything else we have. We are, we are very, very close to about the minimum mill rate you can have for the expenses and the, and, uh, the, the services we deliver. So that's why I'm saying I just don't know where to go at this point other than, you know, abolishing programs. When, when you say that in one breath, people go, well, what don't we need? People would say, well, do we really need recreation? Well, recreation pays for itself. Yeah, it you know, we, you, don't, you don't gain anything. Um, to, to I know that one of our items was uh, lost revenue, the bags, uh, trash bags. How, it, are, that's factored into here as well? Yeah. Yeah. Roughly, how much was that we were going to be losing in I revenue? I think we budgeted about one hundred and forty, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a loss because we'll collect them for the first six <clears> months of the next fiscal year. So we'll go through December, that, right? yeah. And that'll that'll be an item that you're going to have to decide. I mean, there are towns that still charge for trash bags, right. but uh, it's going to be the honor system, and I I just don't know. I don't know. It's not really enforceable. We're not going to. I'm not going to spend forty or fifty thousand dollars to go out and have people go out and flip trash cans to see if they've got right. green bags in there. So, I, it's it's tough. I think Kenny Bunk Port does that with the trash bags, but when they get dumped into the these top of these trucks, uh, yeah, they're in. Bob, I, I hate when we use that word mill rate because it, it it it's to me it's so meaningless. And if we if we start doing comparisons. Town to town to town, uh, I, I think you know unless you unless we're using the state's number of, of valuation uh, and, and use that and kind of to decipher what the mill rate is based on that, uh, I have a hard time putting any. Yeah, that's very true. When we're at, I don't know, we're below 70% now. Um, some of the towns around us are closer to 100%. So you'll see Falmouth and I believe Cape, their mill rates are in the probably the 14s, and we're going to be in the 22s. But they they just finished a reval, so they're already readjusted to full valuation. Right. We'll be down in that $13, $14 range when we, when we reset. But we don't know what that is yet. We won't know probably is, for another Is there year. a way to take that state valuation community 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 and and come up with a mill rate that that's oh I, I can show you that I can show you that mill rate if you want to see that in in the next presentation I'll, I'll take all the towns around us in Cumberland County if you want we can get the whole county and I can show you what their equalized mill rate is that's easy to do ironically this year from this year to last year we dropped two dollars we were over 14 last year, and this year we're at 12, 12 and change. And I was, I go, how the heck did that happen? And that's on the state equalized mill rates. So the state does it. They basically go in and equalize mill rates every year because they have to give you money for education. And everybody has to be kind of at a level playing field for that to happen. So I, I'd be happy to do that so you can see where we are in comparison. That would be closer than what we have today. Right, right. I, I, I think that I, I would... <laughs> No, that I'll, would be something I'll, I could. I'll bring I'll bring them all in for Cumberland County, and you can look at them. Yeah, you know what? I'll oh, go ahead. Please. But based based on conversations that we've had with with staff and with uh, department heads, you know, we're, we're we're not meeting the needs of the community, or, or you know, well, we'd like to have three more paramedics. We'd like to have another. 
police officer. We'd like to have X, Y, and Z. We'd like to. Uh, so we're not we're not overspending by any stretch. Um, yeah, it's it's hard when you went through your last presentation by the you know fire police and police chiefs, and they basically showed you the strain they've been under, and where we are in comparison to our neighbors. It's 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 we're much further behind than I thought we were going to be, especially on fire EMS. So, um, but where, where does it stop, Bob? When, when, I, when I'm landing on our side at, you know, 6% and we're at 370,000, you know, that by itself is, is probably somewhere around 30 cents uh, on the mill rate. Um, uh, but again, then we come down here and we've got to add another, you know, 30 cents for uh, the TIF when we combine everything and subtract out our revenues, we're, we're pushing 35, 36 cents on the mill rate as a town. And then you've got the SED and the county as well, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you've got a pretty big number. So, and this year, worse than any year with, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think what it was, 600, 600, 700 uh, properties this year, last year that got the stabilization rebate. Uh, they're not going to have that rebate from last year applied to this year, and they're going to be paying for two years of increases in taxes, and that's going to be like a 10% increase in taxes. So that's, that's a heavy, that's a heavy uh, thing to carry, and I'm, I don't know what much more we can do when we get the services that we deliver for just under $6.8 million net um, I think we do a pretty good job. So when when Chris and I and Katie sit down and we kind of just go, okay, where can we go next? We're not going to move the needle that far, you know. Like I showed you last time, you know, it's it's going to take, I think it was $150,000 to move it down 10 cents, you know. Well, it's fun. It's frustrating, right? You look at the loss of $155,000 in state revenue sharing, and then you look at an increase in our insurance of $157,000. Those two cover the entire increase. Right. 300 and what? Well, the workers' 70, comp is 200,000. Just insurance right. and just losing that. All right. Cover that. And so it, it, you know, it strikes me that we can go, I start highlighting bigger sections where we're spending almost 100,000 more this year than we did last year, or budgeting 100,000 more, and saying, do we focus on those areas, or do we simply take I mean, each section, if it drops a small percentage, it reaches that. But it's, it strikes me as those are the big issues, the revenue sharing and $157,000 increase in insurance. But yeah, what can we do about the insurance? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. No, well, we're working on it. Uh, well, but we, we, not, we may not well, yeah, get it applied till next year. <laughs> I mean, we're, uh, uh, Katie and Chris are working on uh, with Maine Municipal and Workers' Comp to try to re try to you know set up things that would reduce that by you know potentially fifty thousand, but that won't show up until next year's budget. So the savings that we're trying to plan for, we can't take credit for this year. It'll be you know the following years. Um, you can you know we lost bag revenues. That, that was another hundred and fifty thousand mark, and that was you know we just oh, right. because we've gone to the automated pickup. We saved a little bit on solid waste collection in our first year because the first six months are just the way it is now and then we're waiting for the new truck and when that get when that arrives it will probably be early spring that uh, you know, the two containers will be delivered to every household so we'll have some work this year to do uh, to do that now the one thing the things I will tell you that I'd really like you to think about for our next meeting is the uh, what what's not in the budget you know we don't have anything yet in here for um, the comprehensive plan that that's not free you know, you're gonna you're gonna have to hire consultants, mapping consultants, a lot of people to update that. That was over a hundred thousand last time. Probably be closer to 140 this time. Um, I'm trying to think. We didn't fund any of the, the additional uh, uh, requests for um, employees for any department. Those all got cut out in the first round. So uh, that that'll continue to come back every year to you. And as people look at what we're providing for services, we're gonna get stretched. So. Uh, the regional, the regionalization thing. As much as we we talk about it, we've got to figure out a way to do something about it because honestly, the future isn't bright if we're going to continue on the path we are now. Everybody build their own empire and try to figure it out. It just doesn't work. Does the fire budget increase of one hundred and six thousand? Does that include any additional staff? I didn't think so. Right. Okay. Even based on last week's presentation or two no, weeks ago. Okay. No. No. 
No, I know you and I talked about adding, you know, taking more from the TIF budget, uh, which you could do, uh, but um, I wouldn't recommend it. You're you're already. I think we uh, talked about almost that. three and a half people are funded through TIF right now. Paramedics. Right. Yeah, that's. And the concern is at some point those TIF funds run away. out, and then you have to move that back into a general fund, which would be a significant mill rate increase. And so it's almost like once you put it in, you never bring it back. Well, it's, it's hard. It it's hard to bring yeah. it back because the only way you could do that successfully, Mark, is if similar to what you have in TIF eight. Anytime you change a TIF district, ask have the ability to throttle the um, either 100 percent, 50 percent, whatever you want to do. Uh, have the ability to throttle that money back and forth if you can, uh, so that you have the flexibility that if you wanted to do something like that and you know basically put more money into the general fund, you could do that so that you could offset some of this. Um, Right now, it would be difficult to do that, uh, only because I'm trying to encourage you to hold off until you see what um, the new school debt will be. Um, the early numbers, I will tell you, are very encouraging. Um, this will probably be the best time to do this project, uh, better than what I'd see any time in the future. Uh, in FY31, you see, I don't know, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars of debt coming off that one year. Uh, so if there's a way to uh, spread that debt out over five years, it would really be a very positive impact to the community. It's going to line up with the reval, so the number is going to sound different, but if it's a 40 cent number today, it's probably going to be a 20 cent number when the reval is in effect. So that's just be careful of what you hear for numbers. But the numbers are going to be lower, and um, I, I think they're doing a pretty good job trying to line up a, a smaller increase and doing what we did just a few years ago with a debt service reserve. Uh, we were able to basically sell our uh, general obligation bonds and receive a fairly significant bond premium that we set aside and put that in the debt service reserve, and then we flattened out the impact uh, as the debt climbed, we tried to keep it as flat as we could for five years until the, until the lines crossed, essentially. And that was a really easy way to, you know, make it a lot, uh, lot more tolerable when we brought on those big capital projects. So I think the school is looking at doing something very similar. And um, uh, Scott and I have been talking back and forth. And uh, I think uh, I'm hopeful that in the next couple of weeks, by the time we have our next meeting, we'll have a better picture of what that looks like. Um, I know we have our joint standing committee this Wednesday night. I, I don't think that's really going to really get involved with the school numbers or what they have because we really haven't received those. Um, I think Megan's going to be here tonight to talk a little bit about the project. I don't think she's going to be ready to give us an update yet uh, on, you know, where they think, uh, you know, the debt service schedule is going to come in. Um, they're going to have to get that from myself and Katie, and we're, we're working hard at that right now with those numbers, and um, I think they're going to be a lot better than they were the last time. Of course, they have to be. I mean, it's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot less money, so, but it's a better timing, at least for us, and then I think as we get more money from Ocean View, if you want to cap it at what you're doing today and then bring some back to the general fund in the future to kind of offset that debt, you might only have to do that for one or two years, and that would really kind of even bring it down further. So you have some flexibility with what you're going to do, but what I would advise is once you, once you shift it back to the general fund, just leave it because it's going to be too complicated to bring it back. Mark? Yes, please. One of the things that's, that's always concerned me is, is that the conversations that are held here are in response to what they do across the street. And, and we're always doing that and, and we uh, I look across the street and we have a basically a flat student enrollment over there and and they're not just coming in with cost of uh, living increases that their, their numbers are projected even higher and yes you, you talk about eight hundred thousand dollars coming off the, off the off the debt but by the time it comes off they will have increased the budget that will it, it we, we never get ahead right? and it's I hate having the conversations, what can we do? We have to stop operating these, my wife calls it, these silos. Uh, you know, uh, we're, this is what we're doing over here, what's doing over here. I would love to have been at the school board meeting the other night and, and talked to the kids who, who were advocating for the turf field for $3 million 
I'm thinking to myself, we could use that $3 million over here to fund some positions that uh, are, I think, you know, talk about value, I think they have more value over here than they do over there. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, we, 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 we say the same things over and over again, consolidations, utilization of shared services, uh, blah, blah, blah. But, Bob, don't, don't feel it's going on deaf ears. I mean, we operate pretty well with, uh, with Scott Poulin and, and Jeff Porter. I mean, we're sharing over $150,000 right now in shared services that you don't even see. Is, is that pretty close, Chris, about 150 It's a little bit higher, actually. Well, yeah. so, I, I know, I know. But, I, but don't get discouraged. I can't, I don't like you living in a silo. When I think of a silo, I think of just showing you the municipal budget. If I just wanted to just say, okay, this is all great, we should be fine, all right, well, let's move on. I can't do that because I know what the county is, I know what this is coming, and I they know what the, old, the don't, overall... They don't, they don't look at ours, right? They don't That's look at... Like, you know, it, there's no conversations, and, right. uh, and, and frankly, again, you know, when you have people over there that only serve for a single term, and, and there's, no, there's no knowledge gained and continuity of understanding... Uh, I've been having, reaching out to a few, um, just sort of when I run into them, about the optics of it all. Unfortunately, because my son's the football coach, I keep getting fed information from him that sort of puts me oh, a go. little bit more in the know than I'd rather be about that. But I've been, I've reached out to Leanne and shared some information with Amy about just the optics, like the turf field seems to be like a Trojan horse because that proposal has $10 million in other expenses that are not new school expenses. Um, but the turf field's got everybody's attention. And the turf field's got everybody's attention when their budget's going up $1.8 million. You know, that's what people are focused on, not on the hard, fast numbers. So I'm just, you know, whenever we can, we need to look at what are the, the real cost numbers. Um, I know it's not their intent for the turf field to be the Trojan horse, but that's, from my perspective, that's a little bit what it looks like. If you look back at the, uh, the Performing Arts Center, uh, that was a very close vote. Yep. And, and had the turf field on it until the very last minute, and they I, removed I think, it. I think the point to understand is uh, there has never been any fundraising over there for anything. Uh, I agree. That, that would be the best way to go you know, for if it. If you want yep. these things, there, there has to be some, some little bit more heavy lifting it's than what, what we'll we're seeing. That's what we'll try to do with the library. Yeah, please do. Uh, I have a question, Bill. Um, so looking at places where we maybe could pull back a little bit, so the housing director, part-time, right? Yeah, it's TIF, though. But that's I mean, within so the TIF, that, yeah. That's no. not in a general fund. Yeah, that, that doesn't help you. That well, that's, doesn't that's help the general It's still fund. a lot of money, though, right? Yeah, oh, so yeah, I'm not saying do it. I'm yeah. just saying. You, you could effectively put that in blue as well, right? And yeah, then that's treat that what as I would like recommend future funded when, when TIF 1 gets renewed, if it does get renewed, right? You know, so like, If you credit. reset TIF 1, that's when you should do that. That would be the best time to do that, when TIF 1 got reset. That would that would be el an eligible cost for a so housing. If I could finish my thought, oh, of course, um, sure. uh, which would be that I think that also coming off of the vote that we just went through and knowing that we're going to be hiring a new town planner, um, and yes, I understand that it's it's TIF. I think that it might be good to kind of put a pin in that um, until not only, of course, have we made the decision about TIF one, but also if we are doing a dig into the comprehensive plan and understand what initiatives people would like to see in affordable housing and kind of understanding whether or not that is an added position or if that's something that either the new town planner, depending on what their skill set is, if, if they could kind of take ownership of that as well. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Um, we kind of do that right now by committee. We yeah. don't really, we do charge the housing budget uh, monies for uh, uh, Carla and Christina today, but my my time, uh, Katie's time, Chris's time, none of that gets charged to that budget. So I, I think it's a little bit of a word of caution I'd give you. Okay. Just be careful where you go with that because 
I think we've really run um, Hawthorne Court very well. Yep. It's well maintained. It's it's uh, you know roofs are replaced, heating systems, windows, uh, kitchens. We we've done a lot of work there, and we're very uh, diligent in trying to keep the place looking good. We also have a lot of outside stuff we'll have to do over time. You know, siding, patios, fences, all of that stuff doesn't take care of itself and has to be done over time. So. For me, we've used a lot of town resources to kind of, you know, keep the costs lower. One of the recommendations you got from the housing task force was to look at that and try to tie that into some income level so that it isn't open to everybody, that maybe it should be 60 or 80 percent AMI so that uh, the people that need it most could be, could, there, could be there and stay in the community. So those are going to be tough tough things to wrestle with. Uh, I mean, obviously, it wouldn't impact any residents that live there today, but th those waiting lists have been around for 25, 30 years, and people that have been on them for a long time are going to be pretty upset. It'll be one way to shrink the list pretty quickly, but at the same time, when I look at the residents that are living there today, it's almost, almost that by default. So most of the people that are there really, you know, would have probably qualified if, they, if we had a... Uh, an income qualification today. So, I, you know, I would be careful to change too much because it's a system that's very, that has worked very well for many, many years. Um, but you're right. I mean, sometimes the appearance, not everybody knows how TIF and general funds are tied together. So the appearance of basically delaying some of these things as well is not a bad thing. Well, I was know? also just wondering as we're hearing the murmurings of if the state, it, so we know that they're what, uh, we need to hit 80,000 housing units by 2030, according to what the Mills administration has asked for, right? So if we're not beginning to hit those numbers or looking like we're even close to hitting those numbers, it's possible at some st point the state could intervene and say, okay, Cumberland, you need to go off and build X, Y, Z, right? And so I'm just, and none of us know what the timing looks like on any of that, but um, it would also just be interesting or it'd be a good exercise to kind of prioritize what we're doing or, or maybe it maybe it's where we get, uh, talk to Steve Moriarty and Teresa person try to understand what's happening at the state level around this because at some point right we're gonna possibly lose home rule and it could be a situation where the state is giving us a mandate on what we need to build uh, that's very true that's very true they could basically you are creatures of the state all your authority comes from them so if they take it away Developers could come in and, you know, basically double lots, you know, lots that are anything less than uh, anything more than a half acre could have another unit on it. Anything more than two acres could have four more units on it. I mean, that could happen, and your zoning could go right out the window. Tig, you bring up a great point that a lot of people aren't paying attention is that we are creatures of the state, so we have to be careful that they could take our authority away that scares me, but what scares me more is if employers start waking up and saying, I can't attract people to my you know, workforce anymore because there's no place for them to live, what happens to Texas Instruments? You know, what happens to Unum? What happens to some of our major employers in our area when they can't get workers because they can't afford to live here? They move out of state. And then you've got big empty warehouses everywhere and you're kind of fi trying to figure out what's next. And that singly could have the biggest impact on our economy, more so than um, anything else does. So I'm a little bit worried about the reaction from the big, big employers in the state. And if that goes, if that starts to creep out of state, we're going to all be in a lot of trouble. We really are. So um, we should keep talking about it, but we should also look at our our own zoning and look at in the comprehensive plan and look at, you know, do we look at setback reductions where we have infrastructure in place so that, you know, we're not building all these long roads and long sub big subdivisions in places that are outside of the town, but if there is a way to do some infill and maybe expansion of the sewer so it can allow for that in certain areas that we have everything else but the sewer. So. Those are, those are things to look at probably a little bit more closely in the comp plan. And uh, I think the sooner we start talking about that, I think the better off we're going to be because it's going to take us a few months to get a committee formed and, and get everybody together and start uh, feeling out a process that we want to see in this next comp plan because it's going to be an important one. And a lot of it will be focused around housing. Can the comp plan 
um, the vendors that we use, consultants, can those come out of TIF? Uh, no. No, okay. No. Thanks. Uh, even, even if you had a huge section of your comp plan talking about economic development? You could use that. You could use that portion to uh, fund. Uh, pro rate. There is, yeah, it would be a percentage. Uh, do you have, other than how it was advertised, do you have a job description for the planner or sustainable? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd love to see that. My, my two cents, I guess, is sustainability has a different definition for many different people. It's not one of those things we can nail down. You know, three years ago, <clears throat> sustainability for Bob Vale was being able to grow enough food to feed our community. You know, for some people, that's what sustainability is. Um, you know, for others, it's being able to pay their taxes while they stay in their homes. That's sustainable, what feels like sustainable. So I'd love to just have a look at it. Yeah, you can look at it. Not that I have anything to add or. Can I ask on the um, like increase in anything that we share, that we have an agreement with North Yarmouth on, are those revenues also set in here to offset? Like I see the library is increasing, um, but I know that what is it, 38% of that is shared with North Yarmouth? Yes. Is that $57,000 number of an increase, does that reflect, so if you go down to the library, it's like row 22, or count, yeah, row, <coughs> all right, maybe it's mislabeled. Yeah, it's probably one of the higher ones. I, oh, I basically go, put these in order R of row change. Nine, row nine in the spreadsheet, there you go. Okay. Uh, $57,942. Is that... That's the total in sorry, row nine of the spreadsheet. Right. Um, I, I, I messed these all up because I wanted to see them from highest to lowest. Oh, got it, got it. Good so call. So they're, um, they're, up, they're up there in their increase. Yeah, there you go, right there. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, is that $57,000 increase, is that our share of the increase or is that the That's total gross. increase? That's gross. Okay. And, and the revenue is in the, in the revenue budget under okay. library. Yeah. Okay. So that, that number, these are all in order of from highest to lowest. Mm -hmm. um, this is almost entirely offset by revenues. The $225,000 increase in the rec budget, um, I think their net, in, their net impact to the, to the overall budget is less than $40,000. So that would be interesting to see if you could add a column in here to kind of talk. I don't know if that, what, oh, how much work that. that would be, just to yeah. see which ones kind of pay for themselves versus which ones are yeah. a true cost. Um, yeah. Because I think it would be helpful if we're talking about targeting in on things. Either you do what you can to increase revenue in those areas that they pay for themselves, and then maybe at the end of the year you do a, a funds transfer to cover other areas that maybe aren't self-sufficient. Um, but then on the areas that are just true costs, we could focus in on those. And I think sorting it by highest to lowest makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it just kind of gives you a look at it, and and you know you, you hit it right right smack right on the head when you started um, at a hundred and fifty seven thousand. Our yeah. insurance increase is huge. Um, we're dealing with this at Ecomani as well. Our property and casualty insurance went to from less than three hundred thousand. It's over a million dollars now, and they're looking at uh, potentially decreasing our insurance of of insurability of the plant from, you know, 100% down to 75, 50, and 25 to kind of bring those premiums in line. And they're looking at potentially, you know, is it cheaper at some day when that plant um, is out of, out of useful life uh, to turn it into a transfer station and haul it to Juniper Ridge instead of building a $200 million facility, they could build a $20 million facility for you know, essentially what the same service it would provide. I think it's short-sighted, but I also think we're going to be pushed in those type of directions fairly soon with uh, challenges and costs. Uh, we'll prepare this over overview for you that uh, tries to line up the uh, revenues as best as we can. But remember, we only have about 13 categories of revenues. So you'll see a small, like, fire department, uh, they'll, they'll be like, uh, 100 and, like I said, 180,000, 185,000 in uh, revenues uh, offset against their, you know, 1.4 million uh, budget. Um, but you know, I'm looking down through here. Some of these have no revenues tied to them. Like, what do you do with the town clerk, for instance? Um, she basically collects all our fees, everything in the town, it comes through the clerk's office. So 
they, they touch it, basically all the money that's non, uh, pro even the property taxes they touch, everything comes through that, those windows. So, you know, how do you assign something there when we'll just, we'll do our best to kind of split it up a little bit. One might categorize those with a different color code or something. Uh, yeah, municipal building. Code enforcement is, a, is an actually a pretty good one. Um, his budget is, is entirely paid for as well. His, the fees they generate in inspections have always paid for themselves and paid for the staff there as well. Um, Streetlights marks an interesting one because you're basically self-funding your own, your LED lights that you have out there. So, you know, you, you know we did 10% a year just as a placeholder. I mean, you could do nothing or you could budget half of that if you wanted to and it just would extend your payback to, uh, to that fund. Um, yeah, some of the smaller stuff I don't know if I'd bother too much with, but um, yeah, we can we can certainly do that for you and, and come back to you with uh, you know what what our, our eyes are to a point where we just don't know anymore and yeah. we don't want to do something that is extreme without you know discussing it with you first and saying is does this make sense and you know remember the charter gives you the authority to basically give recommendations on the gross appropriation for each department. The individual line items are given to you in that budget book just so you can see how it's built. Because if you don't know how it's built, then you don't know where the money's going and how it's worked. So for me, I think we've always given you the books. We've always given you the, I call it the look behind the curtain. But, um, you know, this is how we've put our budgets together and kind of been open and uh, tried to be as transparent as we can. But it comes to a point where you're going to have to make some tough decisions someday about you know what's what's going to fall off what's going to fall out of the municipal side of the world and we may not be able to be to do all these these great things we're able to do today so a lot more to talk about but i have honestly um had the most difficult time with this budget uh primarily because uh, i think we've come out so out of some very difficult years and we've been able to keep a high level of services and that high level of services can only move forward if we look at how do we avoid future steep increase in costs and that only can be done if we have a bigger department and most of these bigger services. So. And we, uh, or can we, and will we, can we put our insurance out to bid? Uh, yes, but I don't know if we can do it for We're July 1st. Clark is our provider right now, right? Our agent, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Our agent. Okay. We pretty much, Massamont and Tri Trident are the majority of the insurance carriers we use, and they seem to be, uh, and travelers as well. So those those are the big companies that are bidding on our insurance. It's not so much the agent, the issue. No, but I, it's, the, it's, um, I think it's just as a responsible, we should at least put it out to bid and see what we get. Okay, uh, we're kind of running out of time, but we'll we'll try. Yeah, all right. Uh, the other thing, that, and I know we're 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 looking for nickels and dimes when because we can't find the dollars. Uh, when I went through the budget here and, and looked at each cost center, and I look at uh, electrical costs, and I look at fuel costs and gas costs, um, can we have a um, we have one number that we can look at that and, and track that as uh, kilowatts, whether we're, um, you know, we're using more than we've been, uh, uh, kind of a, um, a history. Uh, we can. Uh, I'm not we sure that it's a lot of meters. I'm not sure the exercise is warranted, but I'm. Yeah. I can break down the overall cost to show you what we pay in, in the utilities, and you can look at that. But uh, Chris probably does it more regularly than anyone. If you look in the public works budget, he has just about all the uh, the meters listed, and they, he shows those pretty close every well, month, essentially. <laughs> but I, I looked at the library versus West, West Cumberland, and I thought to myself, boy, the library is pretty efficient building, you know. Uh, as I look at the years and I, as a percent, um, and maybe I missed a number there, but. Um, well, the West Cumberland is tiny, uh, a tiny number. I know, but it, as a percent, it's, you know, there's a lot more square footage in the library. Right. And, and they seem to be a more 
it seemed more efficient than the West Cumberland Rec Hall. Huh. Well, that would surprise me because we've put a lot of work into that, and uh, I, I haven't seen a real significant increase. And we've got uh, no, I didn't. heat pumps that, over at the over at West Cumberland as right. well. Right, and, and I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't concerned. I thought the the energy use over there was was pretty good. What the library saw is fairly efficient. Well, I just thought, okay, here's this. I worked out the square footage of the of the rec hall, and then I mentally did the square footage of the library, and I thought, geez, this library is is a lot more efficient than I thought it would be. Yeah. Can I ask a question <coughs> about um, Ion and the tech? Department. So, how many days are they here in person for assistance based on our current contract? Uh, two days a week, and we were asking for a third. And what is the additional cost for that third day? I'm just wondering, just, I'm just looking at contracted services here, and like, yep. you know, I think we've 2024 actual is $155,000, but budgeted 207. So, I'm wondering, is that additional day that 50K? Or is that yeah, like that was because a question I had had yeah too. like it just I, I just I just had to reset my password recently and nothing against them personally they called me back but it took two three days and I, before I really felt like something that I should be able to do immediately that I couldn't do right so it just made me a little frustrated I guess and so I'm wondering how much are we paying for that additional day if they're here two days a week and do we need that and could we cut well that? we had five <laughs> we went down to two. And we're moving up to three, primarily for uh, emergency services, police, fire, because they do police fire. They basically do all the work at the fire station. And we're also, uh, they also do all the work at the golf course uh, on our uh, purchase and sale machines and everything to do uh, with the golf and online signups and all, the, all that stuff as well. So they're, they're busy. They're busy when they're here and um, staff feels pretty stressed when they can't get a hold of them either so well that's what i'm wondering like why are that <coughs> service like why wasn't i able to reset my password on my own like i can in every other website that i use from my bank to my mortgage provider to my you know whatever i just it just struck me as like what are what are they doing you know and so i'm not not to dial in on them specifically but it just was of course staff would feel stressed if you can't reset your password well, yeah. we're also in a time where our last IT person left us and, um, and we're hiring a new person through ION. So they're basically trying to manage it with uh, kind of substitutes right now. And it's uh, been tough, been tough, especially with uh, the power outage we had and everything that went with it. So okay. Well, we're, we just, only, talk, we we're, just, we're, we're just talking about additional areas yep. to look, different fresh yep. eyes. And so that was just an area like, is that extra day, how much does it cost us? For a year, and if it's significant number, like maybe we talk it's two days enough still, you know. So I just I just raise that, but again, I didn't I guess fully appreciate the fact that they're working with fire and EMS and all those folks, and maybe they need more services. That was kind of my question with Valhalla. We spent a lot of money. We're spending a lot of money on um, chemicals and fertilizers, but then we turn around and spend a lot of money on seed and soil. So are we? over fertilizing and killing the grass and then we have to plant it again. I'm no. sure we're not. We're but not. Yeah. But that's also a group that I feel like should be like color coded green because They're th neutral. they pay for themselves, right? right. And so well, like my thought almost. Was, almost. No, they do. Well, yeah, they do. They Way have. closer than they used to. Four they, years. No, now. they've been profitable for how many years? At least now? four years, maybe five. Yeah. Okay. I did have a question about abatements because it sh it does it shows up as a no change, but from 2023 to 2024, we went from 55000 to $302,000. Yes, we did. What's that? Yes, we did. <laughs> Why? Senior stabilization. Mm -hmm. That's the, See, we had to basically expense put, put it, it out, category, and now, we're, yeah. now it's going to be back down to zero. All so. right. That makes it, sense. I okay. did the same thing, Shirley. I looked at it, I go, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I laughed as soon as they told me. I said, oh, yeah, oh. yeah, paying attention. <laughs> I didn't laugh. I gulped. <laughs> and, that, and that's why you have it in this for $1, right? Right. As a placeholder? Right. Yeah. right. Okay. Because that was a reimbursement. Remember, we used to budget like ten or 20000 and then the assessor came to us and said, look, stop doing that. You basically budget overlay, and that's what overlay should be used for. So okay. when you see the overlay budget, you know, it's usually around one hundred to $110,000. Um, that's where those rebates come out of, so it's all budgeted. I, I would, if you don't mind, just like to see how much that additional day is for that. Ion. We'll get just that. A, just a, I mean, if it's nothing, it's nothing. I texted you. 
Okay. Yeah. I, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like the Jetsons. Yes, no. the Jetsons. It should be in your... 16500 for the extra day. For the for extra day. For the entire day. year. For the entire year. Okay. Each day, 16500 <laughs> So hold on. <laughs> the entire year. You can't talk. Sorry. No. <laughs> Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, it's $80,000 for five days a week then. Yeah. Like 16K well, a day times five right. days. Well, Bill's question was what would it take to have somebody on board? We did that originally, and but what happened there was that uh, the person couldn't keep up with the technology changes as well. So when we went to the contracted service, they were do, able to do everything behind the curtain as well as service the, you know, everything in front of the curtain. And that is definitely would have cost us more than 80,000 with benefits and everything else. It was well over 100,000. <laughs> Thank you for texting my watch, Katie. I appreciate that. <laughs> Under insurance, what's RHSA? Uh, retirement Health Savings Account. Okay. So, if you remember years ago, well, some of you don't, but I will share with you. Years ago, we had a massive liability in sick time and vacation time on our books because uh, we didn't uh, cap it, and yep. people had thousands of hours, and we were able to work that down over almost five or six years, and then we capped it at 480 and 240. When people get over that number, so they're not disappearing on us, because we need a, kind of all hands on deck a lot of times here, um, they basically get those put into a retirement health savings account, uh, which goes in pre-tax and comes out pre-tax and when they use it, and they have to basically um, leave our service to basically have access to it. So in the last budget, we had 25000 for HR reserve under insurance. Yep. And we've spent zero so far, but you've asked for it put in for double the 25,000 for 50,000 for next year. So that's the, the, what you do with that is up to you. Um, if you don't fund it uh, and we go over, we go over and that's really your call to transfer at the end of the year. Um, that is for um, essentially departures when people leave our employment and they have big stacks of vacation pay acc accumulated that we're paying out. Uh, one year, we got hit pretty good when we had three longtime police officers all retire within a, like an eight-month span, and uh, <coughs> that kind of wiped us out, essentially. So we've been trying to build up a reserve fund for those cases. So, so that wouldn't be a bad thing to... Uh, go ahead, Katie. We're underwater right now. <laughs> so, uh, 25000 of that is for the new main. Oh, I am sorry. Yeah. That's right. Twenty five for the new H uh, for the new um, uh, Angela. Oh, for right. An Angela's Angela's. Is that what it's for? No, or? no, no, no. Uh, nope. Uh, for the new main um, oh, family oh, oh, leave. Oh, 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 FMLA. That's the twenty five thousand for oh, our point yes, five yes, percent yes. that we have to have ready for the FY twenty six that we need to start taking in FY twenty five start January first. Okay. So twenty five thousand of that is for that. So, okay, the, so that's why that doubles. Correct. Yes, I'm sorry. Well, Thank you, Katie. Good catch. Uh, so that's another thing that, that will probably come up. There's, there's a lot of debate amongst employers right now what to do with that. So uh, beginning, in, as Katie, Katie uh, described, in a couple years, we're going to be paying 0.25% uh, we're required to pay of our payroll, our total payroll, to this fund. It's kind of like a, uh, almost like workers' comp. Uh, where you pay we, into a we fund. We pay half and employees pay half, right? Right. It's all dependent on employees and it's all dependent on your salary. So um, 25000 is what our percentage would be. Uh, some employers are absorbing that for the employee as well. We, we have not in our budget. And um, that, to me, should be a bargained item through, you know, the unions. And we're going through three union contracts right now. So... I don't know where that'll land when we're done, but uh, that's still very new, and there is some discussion that it may go away. So we don't know. Uh, so the family medical leave, well, if, if people have uh, the ability, to, will have ability to take sick time up to 480 hours, I think it is. 12 weeks. 12, weeks, 12 times 40, 480 uh, a year, and I think it's a rolling year. And that's, in many cases, in addition to, you know, what the employer already offers. Sometimes it goes uh, on parallel tracks, which I hope it does in our case. 
So uh, we'll be having to watch that very closely as that develops because the rulemaking for that has not come out yet. So we're not sure what that's going to look like yet, but we've been told you shall basically start uh, putting 0.25% uh, of your payroll into a payroll tax for FMLA. So thank you, Katie, forgot about that. It's 0 0.5. 0 0.5 total, but 0.25 from the employer and 0.5. Oh, 1%. 1%, total. so Even 0.5 better. for <laughs> Just keeps getting employees better. and 0.5 for employers. Yeah. That's, that's state, not federal. State, state of Maine. Yep. State's really just doing a great job for us this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Can I, can I, oh, sorry, Bill, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say um, it's not a huge number, but I, I know we had outsourced our general assistance to the county, right? Right. And I'm wondering, it's a 20% increase. And again, it's not a massive number if you compare it sorted on the spreadsheet, but do we know a little bit why that's, I thought there was going to be some net savings there in terms of, obviously there was the personnel savings of us not having to do as much work and confidentiality and these other things that were important, but I just don't know. If, uh, is it is it because there's a larger need for general assistance, and as a result, we pay based on well, the number se seventy five percent of your general assistance is refunded by the state. Correct. So uh, that so is that'll if be you, reflected in revenues. That'll be reflected in your overall cost because this is your net cost. So all the expenses we pay out of this for um, for rent assistance and other items uh, that we pay out of this are all netted out during the year uh, against the reimbursements from the state. So. We usually spend probably somewhere around one hundred and forty, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and net we spend uh, just under probably thirty-five to forty thousand annually. So you're telling me that that seven thousand dollar increase is our net cost? Increase? No, no, no. Oh. This thirty-five and forty-two thousand is our that net cost. So we're well over a hundred thousand more than that annually, uh, between rent assistance, fuel assistance, so a whole bunch of things that we pay. For for that are eligible state costs. As long as they're eligible and the state has, and we've adopted the uh, you know code like we do every October, we approve the MMA proposal for general assistance and that big chapter of payouts and how much a family can get each month and all that. Um, that's being tracked by the county and uh, uh, they've done a much, much better job than we did because some of our costs last year were basically found to be ineligible and we didn't get reimbursed because we didn't file the right paperwork. So I would try to steer you away from that. Uh, the county does a great job with that program. And in the end, uh, they will be cheaper than we can do it. Because you can't charge out your payroll to that, which we were told, well, we thought we could and we can't. So that's basically our net cost to the county plus a little bit for incidentals. I, I'm pretty sure in your book you have the breakdown of that, I, too. I do, so, yeah. yeah. I had a couple of questions on your recreation. So the credit card fee has more than doubled. Yes, it has. Is there any way to negotiate something We're, with another provider? Or I don't know how that all works, but... You want to it's talk gone about up like that, four times or, yeah, in go the for past it. I know you've years. talked about it through Munis and uh, other things. So right now we did get a new contract. We just got it from her, Deanna, um, with ActiveNet to look review those credit card fees to go into a um, subscription service. So it's like the same every year. I haven't had it. I just got it. Um, okay. proposal so we're going to dive so into that's that. So that's something negotiable that it could come. We're going to yeah take a look at that and and there's only a couple options for these rec programs anyways, and they're very similar in terms of you might pay here, but you're gonna pay for it somewhere else, you know? No, or you I might, know that, yeah. and I, but I know how much recreation depends on it with just the volume of mm -hmm. registrations that, that they do. Yeah. It would cost us a lot more to staff those positions than it would be to just do the credit card. And I believe Pete absorbs that cost into his yeah. I had another question, and this just could be a typo. So, adult fitness, it goes from 75.90 up to 19.4, but it says a 0% increase. $12,000 is not a 0% increase. Let me see. 
It's line 4105. I know you're finding me annoying. I did go through this line by line. Oh, it's a fit. <laughs> Three seconds. Are you, are, are you looking at Munis or are you looking at the sheets? The Munis. Like we budgeted zero for it last year, but we spent this year we've spent seven thousand seven thousand five ninety, and the budget for being proposed is nineteen thousand four hundred. What was the name of that again, Charlie? What, what was the name? Adult, adult, adult Fitness. Adult Fitness. Okay, because some of these budgets have moved around oh, a little bit. I mean, I see Adult Enrichment because that would cover some of what Devin does. It's just a new line. It's just a new line. That's why. Easy fix. Yeah. Where's Adult? Yeah, you need Adult Fitness expenses huh? there, and you don't. Fitness yeah, there, there, there's 19.4 for that. It looks like it's a new program. It was a new program. It was pulled out. Yep. It was pulled out of another line. Yeah. And for this year, we've spent 7590 in that category and 43, 45 cents. <laughs> well, we'll get you some answers on where where that got either combined or how it's changed. That should be pretty simple. Okay. mentioned that um, we instead of giving a travel allowance to Bill Longley we're going to get him a vehicle where does that appear in the budget it's in the uh, capital budget uh, the capital equipment budget okay. uh, we will basically look to use a uh, another vehicle from another department for this year until we get it established because we didn't okay. want to add fifty thousand dollars whatever this happened budget. to the to the free vehicles that we had that turned out to be not. Remember someone gave us some loaner vehicles? Oh, yeah, the electric vehicles. Yeah. They the lease came um, up. Those, were, le those were leases, They had three-year leases. They all expired in March. Yeah, those were. Okay, so they just kind of went away. They kind of went away, yep. We just weren't using them, or? No, we were using them. It's just that we didn't want to spend $8,000 for them to keep them, so we basically gave them back. We didn't, we didn't continue with the free lease after three years. So the program was free offered. It was good. <laughs> yeah, we took advantage of it. It worked well. The vehicles were great. But now we're, now we're using uh, uh, recycled cruisers, you know, to kind of replace that canal. So our plan for our next meeting is really to kind of uh, give you the, the final final combing of the budget, if you will, that we can do, and then um, ask for any additional direction you have. Uh, we will also go into detail into the TIF budget. Um, I will happily wipe out anything that's not even ready to be funded uh, in this year, and but leave those numbers on the side for you to remember how much they actually cost. So at some time, you'll have to kind of plug something into the budget, so you'll see you know, truly where we are today versus what's projected. Um, that's simple to do. And uh, then we'll have a discussion on, you know, what you'd like to do next because um, as far as I can go is really where we are today. If we have to do more, it'll be, um, 
it'll be some direction on what you'd like to give up because it's going to be pro on a program size. It's not going to be you know let's cut three dollars out of the stamp budget. You know it's it's not it's a long way to go. And then on May 14th or 15th, I'll have a uh, basically presentation, full presentation of the public, and uh, we'll probably have a better better numbers, especially from the school by then. So that'll hopefully tighten this up uh, quite a bit. Uh, you know, when you're looking at um, you know over a dollar increase, it's it's it'll choke you. It chokes me every time I see the number. So uh, I've got to we've got to hopefully come up with uh, some additional savings. But, you know, it's a big number. It'll be, you know, 300000 plus to get us down below a dollar. And that'll be a lot. Uh, I don't see that just coming from the municipal side. Hopefully we'll get some of that more savings from the school. And if we can see that uh, number come down, that'll be, that'll be big. That'll be big. Okay. But if you look at the history of our budgeting process, it always kind of goes starts at uh, the high end and then by the time we get to April, May, it, it has come down significantly. We just haven't had those numbers back from the school yet. So hopefully we'll have those by uh, the next meeting and we'll have better news. Mr. Manager, are we allowed to, um, I guess I'm running the meeting, so you can do are we you able want. to allow uh, uh, Ms. Yeah. Ben-Ezra to ask a question here? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Do you mind just stepping up? Wasn't, it's Linda Ben-Ezra, Schooner Ridge. Um, it's not a question, it's, um, well, I guess it is. I would like to ask you to look deeper into charging for the bags, the recycling bags. $300,000 is a lot of money to give up in a year. We're gonna be on a six month plan. Um, it, the following year, it'll be the full 300,000. Um, to me, trash could be an enterprise fund. I, I'm not gonna suggest that, but there's no harm in paying for part of it. And I, as a person who has watched recycling and worked as a volunteer for many, many years, um, there's a whole psychology to this recycling. And I'm afraid that we will see if we give up the bags, the, the revenue, I mean, I, w I would rather see the policemen and the firemen and pay for my bags. But the other thing I'm concerned about is that our actual people get lazy and we will get more contaminants into that barrel that's supposed to be the trash. And so I think uh, it would behoove us to, if someone has the ability to check with uh, Falmouth and Wyndham, I think those are at least two of the ones that have started the system, and see how it's working for them. I mean, if they have some horrible things to say, then maybe not, but I would really like to see that as one place that we could take some serious um, improvements in your budget. But yeah. thank you for all your work, and uh, you know, I appreciate it understand how many gazillion hours you have to put into this. Yeah. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thank you for the comment as well. Do we, do we know, Mr. Manager, or is Falmouth or other towns using these as enterprise funds, trash, like where it's like just no. per? Yar Yarmouth, Yarmouth does. Uh, Yarmouth basically only pays if it comes to the transfer station. So okay. uh, if you do your curbside pickup at your house, you pay for that. Cape, I think, is in the same ballpark. Uh, we don't have a transfer station, and it would double this budget if you wanted one uh, but our you see the last item on the uh, on the budget sheet there is the waste display. I think that's great um, so I guess next steps are you guys are going to spend a little bit more time doing another comb through seeing if any other things can be trimmed and then we'll come back maybe in I guess two three weeks now with a little bit more of like a heat map in terms of which things are paying for themselves versus which ones are kind of true true costs yeah. Um, yeah. And then I guess for the council, any additional questions we have, let's shoot them out because I think everybody, the more eyes on this, the better. Right. Yeah, those four pages, uh, Shirley, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they were all good. They are all good questions. So I'd, I'd, I'd like, like to see a breakdown on the mill rates on the state valuation because it's never did my school homework. Yeah, we'll also have the mill rates uh, in compare equalized mill rates, state mill rates for the county. We'll have that for you. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for preparing this. I know this has been a tough budget. Um, looks like we have another question here. Please. The first one is, I've I mentioned it before, and that's the cost of a police dog. First of all, 
I don't know that why the so town the size of Cumberland has to have a police dog. I'm not, I'm not against it. But when I see budgeted $8,000 a year for a dog, oh I went and did some research. I went and talked to several professional people who were involved with guard dogs and so forth. That's, that's way out of line for, for expenses, including vet fees and food and supplements and vaccinations. It's way out of line. There may be something more there that I don't know of. But I, my, right off the bat, my feeling is you could cut $5,000 off from that. Um, that's number one. Number two, I've heard a lot, and you folks may already have addressed this, of people moving into town as businesses, um, buying single-family homes and putting people of urgent care or, or some type of monitoring to them. And we get, uh, as a town, have to supply emergency vehicles to them, emergency aid, pick them up to put them back into bed and so forth. And, and my feeling is, if it's a true emergency position, I think we should render that. But if it's just a maintenance problem, which appears the people are telling me it is, we should really charge these people for doing this and therefore add to our income in funding the rescue. We're limited on a rescue now. So if, if we send a rescue to Blackstrap, say, to put somebody back in bed for the third time today, we're li we're, we've already heard from the fire department we're doing a disservice to the rest of the town because we don't have a rescue available for them. So you may have already looked into this, but I, I think right there is a chance for additional income if we're not charging for it. But it, it should be something that, that we look into. Other than that, keep up the good work. I'll sit here and listen. and. If I can be of any help, I'd be glad to. And as you well know, I've done this a couple of times. Just, just a few times, yeah. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. Appreciate the comments. Yep. Okay. I think um, if you're okay with it, Council, I think I'm going to probably give us a little bit of a recess before our 7 o'clock meeting, unless there's any other questions from the public. Okay. Seeing none, we will recess for 20 minutes until our regular meeting. Thank you. <laughs>